You're in this position to where your dad's bill, Elliot, may not seem important. Do you understand, you know, the significance of, of when you have moments like this as to what it does for the whole sport? Five, four, three, two, one. Go on to the Welcome to Kevin Harvick's Happy Hour, presented by NASCAR on Fox. We encourage all of you closers out there who listen to us on YouTube uh, to make sure you give us a follow and a like, and wherever else you're listening to your podcast. Um, we went to Dawsonville, Georgia, after Chase Elliott won his race at Texas Motor Speedway, and we're able to sit down with Chase and get some insight on what the dynamic of his team is, some of the things that he thinks, and I thought it was a great time spent with Chase in a really comfortable setting. So hope you enjoy this listen. Thanks for taking the time to, to sit down with us today. And we're in a pretty cool spot. We'll explain all that later. But talk to me about last week, 42 race winless streak. I know that those are always full of questions. And oh, yeah. with, with your scenario and everything that happened with your injuries and, and suspension and everything that led to this, tell me the relief that you felt last week when you took the checkered flag after that race. Yeah, well, first, I'm not, I'm not quite used to seeing you on the other side of the interview. Strange, uh, I know. It is odd. Yeah. I'm, I'm getting used to it. But, yeah, definitely relief involved for sure. I think um, any time you, you, know, you go through a, a period where you're not – it's not just the winning. It's just it really more than anything, it's been not necessarily running like I feel we've been capable of running. So that has been better over the last month or so. And any time that – elevates to a, a new level or into a position that you feel like is competitive again, to me, that is the biggest hurdle. Like I can, I'm happy to answer the questions and do this or that when you feel like you're running good enough to be in the mix. Um, I think a lot of the frustration and, and, um, and whatnot behind the scenes has just been like, man, I know we're better than this. I know we can do, we can do better and at least get ourselves in position. And then obviously winning is um, just kind of the cherry on top, but I think it's more running well yeah. Uh, for me personally, that that is that relief and, and the satisfaction that I'm hunting on a on a weekly basis. So last week watching the race, like it just looked like another step of aggression on the restarts. I felt I felt that you were one of two or three cars that could that were really aggressive on the restarts and it paid off for you. Obviously, you had the strategy early. So explain to me. Why last week you were, I mean, I know you're, you're always aggressive and, and maybe some of that is just the timing of knowing you had, you were in position to win, uh, had the opportunity, but explain that aggression from last week. Yeah, that's been a popular question over, you know, the course of the week. I think, um, it's probably my fault. We, we talked about it a lot on the broadcast, oh, just, gotcha. just pointing it out, but um, it was super, it was, it was noticeable. Yeah, yeah no, I think, um, I think that type of aggression has been there at different times. Uh, it's always easy to point that out when you win the race or mm -hmm. when things go really well or, um, or we have a week like we did you know, this past weekend. I think it's an easy topic to talk about when things are in your favor. I just think that that aggression has, has been there previously, maybe just on days where we haven't run as good or you might not necessarily notice it. Obviously for me, I, I'm in the seat firsthand, so I see stuff that maybe you might not catch on TV or, or if you're not necessarily mm -hmm. up in the front couple of rows. So. I don't know that it's not been there before. I've tried to do a better job of knowing when to exercise aggression at the right time. And obviously experience helps that. And I also felt like we had a strong car. So I think all those things weigh into the decision of, you know, do you, do you take these guys three wide? Do you, do you make this move um, or not? And I just felt like we were, we had a legitimate shot, you know, at the win and, and those opportunities were, really good at the right time to, to make them. So, um, and honestly, now it's just, I, I think in the past, some of it is like risk reward, right? You know, is this, yeah. is this worth the risk right now um, to crash basically uh, in order, am I gonna have a shot to win? Am I doing this to run 10th? You know, what is that risk reward? And nowadays with the way this, this thing races, it's like you just almost have to live on that side of the fence more often than not, or you're just mm -hmm. gonna get totally taken advantage of. So um, a little bit of, of each of those things, but I, I think nowadays just the, 
you have to be willing to take some more risks if you want to if you want to be up in those front few rows. What's it like to race on a racetrack like like last week, where it's just every lap is just on the edge, taking sure. chances? I mean, you talk about taking chances, but in order to run fast at Texas, you have to to take chances, and and then you you live in that that culture of what the Gen 7 car has brought that you just said, you have to, yeah. you have to live on the edge. And, and, and so you, you go through that and, and you look to be on the aggressive side. The one car was on the aggressive side. There was, there was two or three of you guys that, that were on the aggressive side. When you, when you get in a race like that, how do you set your mindset to be different than every other week, knowing that you have to survive, right? but you also have to take a lot of chances? Yeah, I think something that a lot of people don't realize is, I mean, I, I could have gone home Sunday night and crashed mm -hmm. in that in that race, and I would have not been any more surprised by wrecking, as as winning the race. Like those two things, both of those two things could have very easily happened. I mean, th there was four or five instances in the event that I had big moments in one and two that I might not have caught. Like just yeah wasn't necessarily doing anything different just happened to catch at that time and and I look around and I see other guys in that same boat and and some people got lucky and drove off a two and some guys ended up ended up crashed so that that surface there as you well know is just it's super edgy the tire they have to bring to live in three and four is not what one and two wants right. um, at all so it just, uh, you know, it, it puts you into a position that you, you have to be right there on the edge of, of that corner entry into one. This car seemingly is making a lot of pace is how much entry pace you can have and how hard you can drive in the corner and kind of shift that, shift that corner around. Um, and that comes at a big risk when you're, right. when you're driving in deep. So Alan has obviously been with you for a long time. I'm, I'm a huge Alan Gustafson fan. I, I love his intensity. You're a pretty mellow dude. I mean, you, you get wound up during the times, but you're, you're, I would classify you as pretty mellow outside of the car. He's mellow, but I, I've been around him enough to, and probably made him mad enough at some times that he's, you know, he's raised his voice and, and you see the intensity, whether he's riding his bicycle. How does that, how does that push you? Because he, he went to bat for you afterwards saying, I, I just don't understand what, what all the talk is about and, and, you know, rattled off your stats. Knew immediately, he's like, we led this many laps, we've, we've finished in the top five this many times and, and this is what we're doing. Like, I don't understand what you guys are talking about. But ex explain that relationship to me because from the outside looking in, it seems, it seems like he's the one that's always pushing and you know that 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 crew chief driver balance is is important. Explain your relationship and and how that operates between the two of you. Yeah, well, I am glad to hear that because I'm a huge fan of his too. And um, he's not a guy that makes a lot of noise in the media or on the internet or whatever. And that's one of the things I love about him a lot is is he is just head down and and focused on doing his job and making sure that he's elevating the entire team to, to be better, making sure the right people are in place, making sure I'm doing my part, pushing me to be better. Um, and we can just have these open and honest conversations with one another that um, are hard to have some days. If, if, if I don't feel like I'm doing my part or if, if he didn't do his part right or vice versa, like we can just have these conversations and mm -hmm. there's never any ill feelings afterwards it's just like yeah you know what you're right and and we got to go to work and make that better and that's just how our working relationship has always been and it's super simple in that sense I've always tried to let him do his job and and let himself you know let he hold himself accountable first and and he has always allowed me to be me and do the same and mm. just let me do my part and uh and push each other when we need to yeah, and I think that's why it's worked. So yeah, because you hear you hear all the nonsense outside of of your circle, and I, I think it's always interesting to hear from the driver mm -hmm. and the crew chief that are actually in that mix that'll be honest with you and tell you, hey, I'm not going to be the guy that that tells you what to do with the car. I'm going to be the guy that tells you what the car is doing. And Alan is is um, I, I guess he could he could come across super intense, but you guys have to navigate a lot together and to me it sounds like you don't even talk about the noise 
outside of, you handle the noise, Alan is quiet and, and works on the car and you guys communicate. So it doesn't sound like anything on the outside ever even makes it inside the doors? Ever, and, and that's exactly what you want or it's exactly yeah. what I want. And, and that's how he likes to go about his business too. And, and I think that goes back to him letting me do my part, me letting him do his part. He knows I'm gonna have to answer a lot of the questions and he lets me do that, how I feel I need to answer them. Mm. But he knows that when I shut that media center door and I come into his office, that we're going to work on the things that's gonna make us go faster ultimately. And that's our jobs and I, I love that. So how, how have you navigated the change? Because you talk about it more than he does with change into the new car. And yeah. you talk about the things that, that happen in the new car. Like I think about the new car and I think, man, I hate the pedals. I couldn't stay on the gas pedal. I didn't like the brake pedal. I didn't like the fact that I had to drive it in the corner so far. I think about all these things that I hated. Mm -hmm. And that transition and that relationship that you guys have, how did you guys navigate going from the old car to the new car? Because I, had to, I felt like I had to re do some things, and you've openly, openly talked about that. Does he point those out? Do you point those out? How, do you, how did you guys zero in on, okay, we gotta make some changes to do what different? A lot, oh, um, I'm a lot yeah, different. I was and, in that category. And I just don't think people realize how much of a departure this, this car is from, from the last one, or even vehicles that you might race along the way, short track mm -hmm. area, all the above. Like you take all that stuff and it is just way different. How you make speed, how you be consistent, how you make tires last, et cetera. Um, I think Alan has always been at the top of the class or right up there with, with whoever through different generations of crew chiefs For sure. um, on knowing how to extract pace out of the cars, knowing what details in the car that he needs to be focused on and making sure that every little piece of that thing is exactly the way it needs to be. Um, I think this transition to the new car, we have, he has learned a lot more about me and my driving style because we've had to openly talk about a lot of things that we just might not have had to discuss in the last car because we were making pace and, and right. when things were right, we could go fast. Um, so, you know, throughout the course of last season, I started challenging our guys and, and Alan included I just had to be super upfront and honest with them about the areas that I felt like I was not and, and still struggle with, but really not doing super well um, so that they could get a better understanding of the driving side and how they could help me navigate some of that. Because they sit there and look at the data every lap. You know, they analyze it. Alan's watching SMT yeah. just like every other crew chief is. So um, I would love for you to ask him that question, but from yeah. my seat, I think that I think that I have really opened the door for our group to just let them help me as much as possible and look at that stuff and, and know my deficiencies and, uh, and, and kind of start to analyze some of the driver stuff probably more than he's had to do with, with other guys in the past. So you think this is the most criticized you've ever been in your driving career? That's how I felt. I, I've never, I, felt I felt like I was criticized more in the last two years of driving the, the next gen car than at any point in my whole racing career. I, and I couldn't figure it out yeah. without them. Uh, and I, I feel the same way. It's, it's been a total team effort. I mean, seriously, it's been uh, a total team effort. And, and it's taken me going in there and, and uh, you know, confessing areas that I know I've been deficient in, but we've been able to kind of work around. And I'm just like, hey, I've not done this well from day one, but we've got away with it. Or I've not done this right, but it's worked. Um, and we've made it work at, at different points in time. So I start, I start trying to point these things out because as us, you know, when you're in the driver's seat, you just see things different mm -hmm. and um, you can see the areas that you struggle in better than most. And I think some of that data makes a little more sense to us when, when, when you're in it and you see it uh, and you live it firsthand. And, and some of that, even though they look at that data every day, might not make total sense. Um, so yeah, I've, I've opened the door and just said, Hey, I know this is not where it's needed to be. And, and I feel like since I've pointed some of those things out, we've really expanded on them and they've helped me not only analyze and, and fine tune, but find solutions. And yeah. then, and then with their better knowledge of the car and my struggles, how do we build the, 
set up in cars around that and, and make things more comfortable from that side too. Do you think that your teammates help that or hurt that? Because I think there's a few different ways to make the car go. Yeah. There, there always has been, right? There's always different approaches, different feels, different things like that. And sometimes I felt certain teammates actually hurt me that ran fast because of the fact that they did it different. Mm -hmm. And I think that everybody's obviously different. So does that, when you have, when you have two teammates that are winning races and, and doing the things that, that they have done this year and last year, does that help you or hurt you? I think in the past, yes. I, I, I think there were more options to making pace on the racetrack with the old car and how you approach the corner how you could get away with different setups. Whereas in this vehicle in particular, I think there's really only, I only see one good way. Yeah. And, and those, you know, I, I think William and Kyle both do a really, really good job of driving the car that way because they drove the other car that way too. Yeah. And, and I think that became a, a very easy transition for them um, when, when we got to this point. So I think it has helped just because I don't see a lot of options. I, I, see yeah. it, I see that being the way it needs to be done. Um, I feel like I've tried every other option and it, and it hasn't worked. And the more that I, I get in the direction that I think those guys push in, the, the better we are. Yeah. So I went way in the weeds on race car stuff. Let's go back to the after the post race, mm -hmm. the, 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 the Polish victory lap in the Hooters car how long have you thought about that? Like, yeah. did you, was it day one that you got the Hooters sponsorship? Uh, it might not have been day one, but um, probably not too terribly long after yeah. that. I just always thought that would be a great honor. And, and you know, I obviously didn't know Alan at, at all, but had always heard nothing but great things about him. As, a, as an individual, it seemed like he had a positive impact on, on a lot of people throughout the, the industry. and. Um, I, I told this story yesterday or the day before, but a, a photo that has always stuck with me, um, you know, throughout my dad's career was he, you know, he had just lost the 92 championship by very few points. At that point in time, mm -hmm. I think it was the closest championship run in, in a long time, maybe up until Carl and, and Tony there in, um, the late 2000s. But nonetheless, uh, just... I can tell a genuine smile from my father and not, and he had just this genuine smile on his face congratulating Alan and, and Victory Lane, like he just lost the championship by, yeah. by a very small margin. And um, for some reason that has just always stuck with me. Um, and maybe I'm totally reading it wrong, but just kind of said a lot about his character and that he was actually excited for this guy. He did a good job. And yeah. um, that, that's another reason that I, I thought that, uh, you know, what, what a cool tie to just the whole picture and, and the partnership and how far it dates back and, and Hooters and, and how they've uh, been a part of our sport for many years, so. Is that the first time you've, you've done it? Uh, it was, yeah. yeah. I'd never, maybe like in short tracks or something, yeah. I didn't know that I was necessarily doing right. that, but purposely, absolutely. I always thought that when you did that Polish victory lap, it just gave the fans just a much more intimate feel of, of being able to see the driver and wave to the crowd because you're, you're right there, you're right there with them. You, you brought up the, the, the picture and one thing that I always find intriguing about people like you that have been in racing your whole life and been around it your whole life, what's the one memory that sticks out in your head that, not, not while you were driving, but just as you were growing up, like what, what's, what's something that you look back and say, that was probably one of the coolest things I got to do as a kid. Where was it? What racetrack? What was the moment? That's a great question. Um, we try to have, we try to have different good questions, Chase. Yeah, so no, we I don't, we don't want your, we don't want the normal, the norm, uh, the, the normal BS, uh, yeah. race questions. So we try to have a little bit of fun. Yeah, I, I respect it. I, yeah. um, as a kid, I would say the most, uh, special time I had growing up was, you know, when dad went over to, to raise there in, uh, what, 2000, 2000, 2001 mm -hmm. and two. And I was just old enough to barely remember some of that. And I was just kind of old enough to, 
you know, start realizing how cool this was. And mm -hmm. obviously, you know, the, the state that NASCAR was in at that point in time was um, high. High, and yeah. it was incredible. And, and I mean, my gosh, you know, your dad was a part of this, this show that was just on another level like it. And he had retired, he had kind of semi-retired part-time, right? He had, Yeah. He, well, I, I guess. Before the Dodge. Yeah, I'm not yeah. exactly sure. You know, obviously they had their run in the late 80s and then he branched off and tried to do his own deal. Yeah. Um, there in like the mid 90s. So and this was kind of the comeback. This was kind yeah. of the comeback. And, and I think there was a lot of, there's a lot of things that, that went into that. One, I probably didn't realize it as much then, but looking back on it, it makes me appreciate it more. I could just tell the genuine joy he was getting mm -hmm. out of running good again because he hadn't been. I mean, he hadn't, hadn't won a race in a long time. They ran terrible for a few years when he tried to do his own thing. I yeah. know he was stressed out, you know, trying to run it and race on the weekends, as you know. Oh, yeah. It's um, a lot of work. A lot of work, trying to manage people, et cetera. So I just felt like... Uh, Looking back on it now, I see all this stuff, and I'm like, man, yeah, that was, that was special. He was having the time of his life. He was winning races, competitive with a new team. He and Ray got along great. Um, you know, Mike Ford was his crew chief at the time, and they were just, things were rolling. Yeah. And um, so getting to go to Victory Lane and just be a part of those couple years, because that was kind of late in his career, and um, you know, he, he was an older guy at that point in time that was winning races, and it was kind of, odd I guess so that was kind of when the younger crowd was coming in yeah. you were coming in yeah and um, it was just really fun and, and I remember in particular uh, I remember going to Victory Lane with him at Pocono I remember eating popcorn at the Pop Secret 400 at Rockingham <laughs> at Victory Lane and it was just uh, he beat I think he beat Jimmy that day and um, just thinking back on that stuff is so cool you yeah. know and, and realizing just how much fun he was having at that point in time and then now knowing how hard it is to be competitive at this level and for him to have gone through a period that was such a struggle to kind of come back and, and get back in the mix at a at an older age and, and mix it up with uh, with the young guys is pretty neat. Yeah. You have a great relationship with your with your dad and you guys have kind of he's come through your whole path as far as bringing you up and being around the racetrack, going back to racing, you've been to victory lane with him. As you go through the injury, you go through the suspension, <clears throat> what, was, what was probably the best conversation that you remember, the best piece of advice that, and, and conversation that you guys had in this little streak of time? Because things change, things evolve, new problems happen, things move, you know, things change all the time. So I mean, I would, obviously those conversations are always different, but. What's the conversation that you guys had that you're like, all right, I need to do this better, different, or I'm going to get through this with the, with the injury and everything that, that happened through this 42 race streak? Yeah, I, you have to kind of know my dad a little bit, um, but he's just, he, he's not the type of person that is gonna have um, those super one-line things mm -hmm. that are gonna change your life, but he, is uh, you know someone who's just always in your corner, and yeah. and I think that at the end of the day, he's a guy that you might not realize just how much he's paying attention, or just how much he uh, cares about what you have going on, or how much he knows you're struggling with you know not running well or whatever. Yeah. But he totally is paying attention to that stuff, and to me, he's the guy that keeps a really level ground of of just approach on everything, and is just. Um, you just know you have that that support, but you know I think back to the injury and and you know he uh, he referenced well he tripped over a watering hose and you know missed races when, when he was driving for Ray like yeah. and I was around for that I remember that mm. and um, he told me after it happened he's like look you know we've been we've been out here skiing and stuff for a long time and 20 years or so, and this is the first time you've got hurt, so I think you're doing pretty good. You know, that, yeah. that's his- Odds are in your favor. Yeah, so yeah. That, that, that's kind of, you know, some of, the, some of the way he looks at it. But um, yeah, it's, uh, he, he is a guy that also lets me figure out a lot on my own, and, and I, I, I appreciate that because I think it's helped me grow over, over the course of my life and, um, because he's got so much experience and you know he has opinions on a lot of things, but he does keep a lot of them to himself and 
and I think he lets me figure out stuff on my own because I think he knows that at the end of the day that's gonna that's gonna help me uh, more at the end of the story than, than anything. the long haul. Yeah, he knows that, that in the long haul that's gonna make it better. So you're in this position to where your dad's Bill Elliott. There's only a couple. There's only two of you that I would put in this category, and that's that's you and Dale Jr. The importance of you winning a race this weekend may not seem important as important to you as I view it. I view it as, you know, when Dale would win, it lifted all, all tides. Um, when you win, I, I view it as the, as the same thing. And I've been around you enough to know that you want to be humble and, and do those things. Do you, do you understand, you know, the significance of, of when you have moments like this as to what it does for the whole sport? Probably not. Um, pr probably not completely. I, I, I do understand um, a lot of it. I mean, I, I get it. I get, yeah. I get how I know you don't like to talk about it, but I, I, I mean, it's a, it's a big work. deal. And I recognize that. I just, um, you know, for me, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to start racing to, to, you know, it wasn't a popularity contest for me. Yeah. I, I wanted to start racing and race because I wanted to be one of the best, uh, you know, from a competitive standpoint. And I've always tried to stick with that mentality and, and stick with just knowing that um, being me is the best way for myself to have happiness and just do my part and, um, and continue to let the competitive aspect of, of racing drive me because that's what's always driven me since I was a little kid. And uh, I think if I ever lose sight of that, then I've got some bigger problems to, to address. And, it's always been competition for me. It's always been the, the urge and, and the will to want to mix it up with people that I respect and, and, um, and put myself in that category. Well, you do a good job at it. And I, I think it's, it's, it's important um, for everybody to know how much effort and time and, and how much pressure uh, is put on. I, I, I believe you and Dale Jr. are the only two people that have had as much pressure Put on you in this sport unwanted because you want to go out and do exactly you just want to be a competitor and sometimes you you just can't hide from that so we're not going to end it on that question we always end the interviews with with the same question what was your first car where is it i had a chevy silverado i um was my first car um, not because I'm a Chevy guy, but it actually was. Yeah, uh, yeah it was a You black. wouldn't believe some of the stories that we've heard from it, first cars. But. Yeah, so um, that was my first car. I had, uh, that car was gifted to me um, by my parents, obviously. Um, we had gone down to, uh, the Snowball Derby was always right around my birthday. I, we were typically down there mm -hmm. or fixing the head that way as, you know, that time of year, late, late November, early December. Um, so we went down there and yeah, I just turned 16. I think we won, that was the, we won our first snowball derby that year. And, mm. um, I guess mom or dad had, had put, you know, the truck, uh, kind of hit it after I had left and got home and, um, you know, had a big bow on it, you know, this or that yeah. when we got back from, from the race. So it was an amazing week because. We, we go down there and um, I'm, I'm fairly certain, somebody might want to fact check me on this, but I, I do think we won that weekend. And uh, yeah, I got home and, and had this awesome truck, you know, given to me for my 16th birthday. And uh, yeah, man, went, to, w went after it. I don't know where it is, I sold it. You sold it, so I you didn't wreck it. it. Denny Hamlin ran his in the back, into the back of a school bus, his first car. Okay, yeah, no. So your, yours, ended, yours ended with a sale, which, my, which means you were paying a lot more attention driving, so. Maybe, or yeah. maybe, or just got really you lucky. Got, you got away with it. <laughs> got away so, with it. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was, uh, man, when I was 16, I was, I, I would definitely consider myself a speeder on the road. Yeah. But man, crazy what a difference 16 to 28 makes because I am five over at the max nowadays. I'm right mean, there I'm, with you. I am just cruising uh, on the road. I do not go anywhere fast anymore. But there early on, I do think I had, uh, had somebody watching me because it was not smart. No, I was, I was in that same yeah. category. Thanks for taking the time. Thank today. you. I appreciate, appreciate it. it. Thanks. Yep. Yep. I want to thank Chase Elliott for taking the time to, to sit down and give us a little insight to uh, his world and everything that happens with it. Uh, I enjoyed uh, everything that, that we were able to talk about. We encourage you to follow us on 
uh, anywhere on social media at Harvick Happy Pod, or give us a follow on YouTube and check us out uh, here on Kevin Harvick's Happy Hour presented by NASCAR on Fox. Thanks for listening.